my, my introduction to Ahmed was actually through Fran Ferris. So Fran, you see her on the screen also. Uh, Fran is, is my good friend and colleague who teaches at Golden West College in Huntington Beach, California, but she's also on the board of directors of the Euphrates Institute. And the Euphrates Institute does peace building education, global education, and I'm starting to do a little work with them. And uh, back in September, well, back in July or August, I suppose, when things were really bad and they were airlifting people from Kabul and Afghanistan, Fran reached out to me and, and asked me if I, if I knew any way or if there's anything that I could do because they were trying to get Ahmed, who you're going to meet, out of Kabul. And I don't know if I really offered anything except that we're also trying to get him into graduate school, but I know Euphrates has been really critical in getting him here. A lot of organizations actually are working with, you know, identifying particular people that they're trying to, a lot of it is humanitarian parole and other means of which people are being sponsored by in the United States. People can do it individually, uh, and organizations can do it also. So I know in this case, uh, Euphrates is doing it. You know, Ahmed is not here yet, Fran. So while we're waiting for Ahmed to show up, um, why don't you Tell us a little bit more about Euphrates and what you've been doing, and then I can introduce him when he gets here. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, Euphrates has been uh, really instrumental about, um, there is a, a, a uh, six month module called the Practice Peace Alliance. And the question that earlier Mina put that in that, yeah, I mean, like how would you say the personal piece aspect of things, things starts personal. So this is based on the work of uh, Dr. Whitney McIntyre Miller uh, about peace leadership that goes from personal to communal, to societal, global. And, she, and she's presenting next week, if you remember. She's presenting next week. Very, very informative. Uh, I mean, like, you know, thoroughly have thought about the, the process. And so we are kind of put the peace leadership based on her work for, uh, it's a six months and it has the modules, goes, you know, the module personal, you do this and, you know, then the co communal and all the way to, to global. And this is kind of like, you know, we have, there are many chapters uh, around the world, Afghanistan being one of them. At the end of the course, what people do is that they, they choose a project and they're almost, if their project is being uh, approved, almost we have a guarantee uh, from a grantor that their project will happen. So Ahmed was one of them, Mr. Ahmed Chakiri, he was one of those who attended uh, the Peace Project and the uh, Practice Peace Alliance March, you know, went to the program and, um, he has been doing a lot of youth empowerment program. And, uh, and so in that, um, in really working with the youth uh, and doing workshop and bringing every one of these uh, modules into existence, working with them on nonviolent communication, personal, uh, uh, personal leadership, personal peace practices, and so on and so forth. So everything that he had learned through these modules, he would also take it in. And um, so he had worked with many different organizations and I think they were just in process of working with, um, 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 I think they, they, he had worked with USIP, he had worked yeah, yeah. with, um, you know, um, he had worked with uh, uh, Search for Common Ground, you know, they were kind of like, you know, of making alliance here, door. it was enough to really put his name and his organization at one of those places that um, Taliban would be looking for them. Yeah. So when this all happened, and um, it was very clear, because up until then they have uh, workshops for women's rights, um, human rights, youth empowerment, doing all these works. So it put him personally and the whole organization on the list of a Taliban, they were very sure that, that you know, they, they would go, they would be looking for him. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that was like, you know, we all had no idea how to get him out or, you know, it was just things got really deteriorated really quickly. And here is Ahmad Jock, uh, and he can tell you the rest of the story. So we were all trying to get him and the group out and, uh, and, uh, you know, it just uh, worked out and we are just besides ourselves that he's safe. And uh, I reached out to David and 
I'm telling you, at these moments, just being an ear to listen to these things would allow a lot of things to happen. We can think it through and all of that. But I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, you listening to us. Well, and, uh, it opened I, up a lot. I don't know. If, and I, I, I've been working and I can really tell you at the back end of the, some of the things that I've been doing and trying to help. Afghan scholars get in the United States. But I want to turn it over to Ahmed Shah and um, a little bit about Ahmed. If you go to the link, I think you go to Ahmed's Twitter account, which I think is still active. I know his organization is no longer online. Ahmed in 2016 founded and has been since then the director of the Afghanistan Youth and Empowerment Peacebuilding Organization. And Ahmed can tell us about the work of the organization and whether it's still operating. Uh, before that, he was a program officer for Asia Culture House. He has a bachelor's degree in English from uh, Maywan University in Kabul. And I believe, Ahmed, you're still in Berlin. Is that correct? You can turn your microphone. Yes, sir. Uh, Are you still, you're still in Germany? Yeah, I'm still here. Yes. Okay. Okay. So you have our full attention, Ahmed. You can um, approach talking about your work, talking about your situation, talking about what you're hoping to do, any way you want to take it. And then We'll just kind of hold questions and then we'll take questions all at one time and maybe in about 20 minutes or so. So please, uh, floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, sir, for, uh, for first, I would like to apologize for, for being late. Uh, I, I ran into traffic and then, uh, yeah, it got a little bit late. And secondly, I would like to take the opportunity and thank you for inviting me to speak to the ninth Noble National Community College uh, Peace Building Seminar. It is uh, it's a great honor to be here and, and share some thoughts about uh, my works and also about the country and, and the prospective plans. Uh, as an Afghan living through decades of uh, deep-seated conflict and uh, chaos in the country, I envisioned a new Afghanistan when I founded the Afghanistan Youth Empowerment and Peacebuilding Organization. And catalyzed by this vision of a peaceful land we are afghans of different backgrounds and different ethnic groups uh, live in harmony aipo emerged in january 2019 as a space for youth to experience peace and also model peace in their communities but for me personally it all began in a in a village in central afghanistan uh, in my childhood home in uh, malistan district of uh, ghazni province and despite the, the, the daily struggles uh, of living in Afghanistan, a country that has never, uh, has not seen peace and prosperity in the last four decades and, and before that, my childhood home, uh, home provided me the, the education, safety, and life that enabled me and my brothers to, to imagine a, a reality, a, a different reality in the country. I found uh, an inspiration from my mother, a dedicated uh, single mother who raised uh, me and my brothers to the values of equality, inclusion, compassion, uh, as well as social responsibility. And to instill in us uh, uh, the values uh, and the commitment that we do things that not only benefit ourselves, but also others and community. Uh, she provided me with an education, though she herself was not uh, educated. And she taught me skills uh, for building deep relationships. She also encouraged me and my brothers to be the change that we wish to uh, see in the world. And this powerful atmosphere, this powerful home served as a model for, for hope uh, and for what was possible, a reality which was not yet mirrored in Afghan society. And uh, this was some of the reasons that inspired me to, to go and start the organization or AIPO. And in addition to that, Afghanistan is uh, a young country in which the, uh, the majority of population, which around 65% of the population uh, constitute the young people. And in that sense, uh, young people are the present and the future of the, the country. But unfortunately, uh, because of the four decades of war and persistent war and instability in the country, young people, especially young women and girls, they have been pushed into uh, the margins of the, the society and they do not have a lot of 
opportunities to engage. Uh, and still, I feel like there is still remains the scope to bring these uh, young people together through platforms and organizations or initiatives like IEPO. And uh, I personally strongly uh, believe in youth engagement and inclusion as a pathway in order to witness or achieve peace at the grassroots level. And therefore, as a, as a peace building and youth empowerment or, uh, organization, IEPO focuses on empowering the youth with tools for peacemaking as well as personal transformation and also creating a space where youth from different backgrounds and different ethnic groups, different communities, they come together uh, to talk about themselves, to talk about the challenges, to talk about the, the problems that they face the personal level and those that everyone face in, in the community with the hope that the spirit of the dialogue and story sharing uh, bridge, bridge the gaps and like break the walls of separation, which is projected through the prolonged conflict and atrocities that happened in the past few decades in the country. And the organization also uh, provide an opportunity for young women and girls uh, uh, to work with us and, and to see that how they would be able to, to uh, drive change within their communities. And IPU, beside that, IPU has also partnered with different organizations in the United States, like USIP, Euphrates Institute, and also in Germany and the, uh, in the Netherlands with the United Networks of Young Peace Builders. And together we have organized different in person and online initiatives like Peace Camp, art competitions, and other programs uh, which have sparked hope and transformation within their communities. And in spite with the uh, idea and well, being with AIPO, some of our participants went on to, to create their own initiatives in order to apply the, the learnings of the programs in their personal lives and also into, uh, into their communities. And in, in core of our program has been not only to train these young people, but also to instill them with this uh, idea that they should organize and do similar things when they go back to their communities and that way we want to like uh to, we want that the impact of the program go far beyond the the, the, the events or the training or activity that they attend and uh, since the establishment of the organization we have done a lot of programs and one of them that stands out is a peace camp uh and which we organized late uh, yeah, early june uh this year so uh from May 2020, IEPO had scheduled so different uh, programs and trainings that we wanted to do. And one of them was a peace camp, which was organized from 7th to 11th June, and which was funded by USIP and organized with collaboration of Euphrates Institute and some organization, Australia and uh, friends, other places who joined uh, to support and, and, and make the program a success. So this unique program brought together around 20 youth uh, from 11 provinces of Afghanistan to uh, not only to polish their uh, skills, but also to uh, empower them with new skills and experiences that would help and enable them so that they expand their works when they go back to their communities. And we also expected that after uh, upon completion of the program, these young people would go on uh, to their communities and multiply the whatever they've learned across the, the, the country using their own visions and also creative solutions uh, that would like uh, help them so that they tackle the specific problem or a specific con conflict that they, they, they face within their community. So these are a few examples of the, the programs that we have done. But unfortunately, uh, the security situation in the country uh, was de deteriorating uh, since July, and we were first, uh, in a sense, to hold our programs by August. Life in in the country was totally changed as Taliban were uh, like capturing one province after the other. So the fall of uh, and then this all uh, developments led to the fall of Kabul on August 15, in which the not only a government collapse but also the a lot of dreams, a lot of hopes, a lot of visions, a lot of sacrifices, a lot of efforts that has been uh, built and worked and people had in past 20 years uh, got shattered. And especially uh, young women and girls and the youth uh, in general found themselves to uh, 
uh, in a state of uh, despair and uncertainty. And uh, Taliban took power on uh, August 15, and it's the same day that Afghan President Ashraf Ghani, he escaped the country, betraying his people. And with that, he also left a generation of youth raised with the ups and downs of democratic values to deal with the uncertainty of Taliban, a group with no belief in, 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 in no belief and respect in human rights and women rights and democracy and other things that they've been built. And uh, at that time, I knew that my peace building works as the, the, the cable colla uh, collapse. And then I, I know that my peace building works and my uh, yeah, affiliation with different organization, national and international organization, and my woman empowerment work would easily put my life at risk. And I knew that my time in Kabul uh, was over. And then, then I reached out to friends in, in US and uh, also in Germany and Netherlands and different places asking them uh, for helping me to, to, yeah, to escape and to leave the country. And it was, uh, it was August 25th that uh, I and 11, 10 members of the organization were told that we are, our names are an, an evacuation list and we can go to the airport and to get ready to be evacuated the following day. So it was a challenging task to, to get into the airport because it was too many people there. And when one was there, it felt like everyone is there, professionals, young, old, ordinary people, everyone. And it was not a matter that people, those who are at risk, would like to fly, but everyone was there in order to hoping that they make into the airport and then into the sky from the, the Kabul and then into safety. So it was challenging to be there, but uh, miraculously and with the support of uh, friends like Farhan and other friends from Euphrates and Institute, we were able to get pulled in by Marines into the airport and then uh, and then from there. So we were one hour away from the, the explosion that happened at the Abbey Gate that took the lives of many people, including uh, some wonderful Marines who have saved thousands of lives. Uh, and then we were evacuated to Qatar and from Qatar to Ramshain Air Base, and then US authorities passed us on to the, uh, to the German authorities because the team, we were initially invited uh, by the, the, the Germans, uh, German government, and then uh, the team wanted to stay there. And then uh, the American authorities passed us on to the the German authorities, and then uh, it seemed like the process, and, and then we are like it is two months that we are here, and it seems like the process of resell, uh, resettlement is very complicated. Uh, and now my I and my team, uh, in a sense, face that this sense of legal uncertainty, and we believe in this state of limbo, and we don't know that when uh, like uh, we will get a visa or when uh, like. We will receive a residence permit, which would enable us to to be able to to start to have a fresh start, not only life but also to study language and and, and follow other things that we want to do. And uh, to just briefly share about uh, prospective plans about IFO, I would like to say that I missed all this uncertainty of like resettlement. I'm hopeful to be able to resume the work of IEPO through the power of uh, technology and to be able to reach uh, to the youth in the country with uh, and also into the hearts of the communities. But it's still uh, the future of IEPO looks unclear, partially because of my transition, uh, uh, transitional status in Germany, but also because that part of me also resides with my family uh, back at home. Um, uh, my mom, my wife, my, my son and others. And then, and any Afghan who is like, try to build a life, uh, any Afghan trying to build a new life will struggle uh, with this tension of moving forward in, in their career and life while looking back at those who have been left behind. But I hope that I would be able to, to meet people or find ways in order to uh, yeah, move my family out and reunite uh, with them sooner or later, but the sooner would be better. And I also anticipate to come out with some, some creative ways of preaching to the young people in the country, uh, because I feel that though th there's so much that has been lost and young people, they've, they, they've gained a lot and they, they work hard, they championed whatever we have achieved in past two decades and it all got shattered. And I feel a sense of responsibility. When we were in the country, it was kind of easy to work with young people, but now uh, that is the time 
that we should do because th that time it was easy and uh, so many organizations, people were working, but now I feel like a sense of responsibility to reach to those who have left behind to instill them with the hope and also to see that uh, how they would be able to emerge strong in the face of challenges and keep going, receive an education or learn skills um, until democracy surfaces again in the country and then they would be able to, to again follow their dreams of education, of a better society, a prosper and peaceful Afghan society in which people from different backgrounds would have a chance to uh, and I say to, to that and also the ability to, to follow their dreams and do the things that they want to do. And with, la with that, I would like to conclude that, uh, that with the support and with, uh, uh, I've been uh, like, uh, yeah, we have got here and it is so exciting to be here. And I'm also excited because of being accepted to great school in, in US and, uh, and the possibility seems infinite and uh, though, it's not clear when I would be able to get there, but, but I'm very excited and looking forward to, yeah, to, to coming and to being in a land full of opportunities and to see that we're from there and uh, doing my master's degree would enable me to, and to, yeah, to, uh, to still contribute to what I do and to see that how I would be able to, to contribute to peace building in a broader uh, sense. And with that, yeah, I would like to, again, thank you, sir. And uh, I would like to stop there. Thank yeah. you. Amitra, let me ask you a question. I'm uh, asking about your family. I know your wife and your son are still in Afghanistan. Are you able to communicate with them or keep in touch with them? Uh, yes, yeah, sir. I, I, I call them on and off. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I yeah, am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and they're safe? I mean, uh, conditions? Yes, they, are... they're at the moment, they are good, yes. Okay. And yes, sir, because they live in a distant community where sometimes there is there is no power or sometimes there is no antenna reception so it's kind of hard sometimes one manages to to be in touch and sometimes I, yeah. I cannot do that yeah okay thank you all right so let's take some questions why don't you just go ahead and open your microphone we don't have to use the chat box we're a small group right now and um ask questions of Ahmed Shah things about Afghanistan or about his work um please Michael, go ahead, Michael. Thank you so much for your, your moving story. The real life experiences are sobering. Um, forgive me, I'm taking my exercise walk, but I've been listening to every word. My question is, what in your opinion, given the realities currently facing Afghani people and the prospect of starvation for millions that is being covered by Al Jazeera and such news media networks. What in your opinion might we in the US most effectively devote energy to alleviating the current needs of the Afghan people. For example, would you advocate the United States or that we advocate Congress to free up the frozen assets yes. in banks in the United States and elsewhere so this cash to be made available uh, to people in Afghanistan? What do you suggest? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for, uh, yeah, for that. Um, Good and timely question, and uh, yeah, as as you you see on the news that the situation in the country is so bad, and it's not just one problem that names it. Like dozens and dozens of problems that this, like the humanitarian crisis that is happening, the starvation, and and that women and girls are not allowed to to go to school, and there is like this. Uh, you know, summary executions and, and so much, and like the first displacement of Hazaras that are happening in the country in central Afghanistan. And coming back to the, your question, I think in order to be able to, to help Afghans in these challenging times as the, the harsh winter is approaching, I think that uh, uh, the UN and also particularly the United States should help the Afghans with the humanitarian aid and to make sure that this aid and this support would go to, to the people. 
And also regarding coming your question, whether to unfreeze the assets of Afghan uh, uh, bank, I think that would be, yeah, that, that would be a good step, but, but the, the hard part would be to ensure that where we it go, whether the Taliban would have access to that or not, it would go to the people. And, uh, and the other thing would be like to advocate and draw attention to, uh, to helping Afghans to like, uh, like trying to do an advocacy uh, on the international level in order to, so that the countries, they would be able to, to support Afghans with the, uh, with the humanitarian aid at this moment and, and, and to see that how in the long run or in short term, they would be able to uh, put more pressure into Taliban in order to come to terms to new realities and also to see that, how, uh, that they would be able or they, they should uh, allow women and girls to, to receive an education and to just, uh, and also uh, kind of, uh, you know, come up with, with this, uh, like an inclusive government in which everyone is represented. But, but at the moment, the, the, the thing that sh should happen is that, as you said, that it, uh, then uh, like the humanitarian aid that would go directly to the people, because if, if it doesn't happen, uh, people would starve. And there are cases that coming out, there are reports coming out in which families, they sell their, their daughters or their sons in order to be able to, to uh, like, uh, you know, fit the, the remaining ones. So it is, it's kind of hard uh, that at the moment. And, and the more there, there is, the, the more there is advocacy, the, the more there is support, I think that, that much, uh, th there would be this insurance that and, uh, a starvation won't happen in the country. Ahmed, are there NGOs that are able to work? NGOs, are there NGOs that are able to work in Afghanistan right now? Yeah. They, 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 yeah. Yes, there are NGOs that they, they work on education. There are NGOs that they are trying to do fundraisings and then identify the families who are in need and then that way reach out to them. So there are many yeah, organizations that despite the, the, this challenging times, they, they still try to, to uh, do and, and, and to help people, those in need. But, but it would, will be kind of hard that only NGOs uh, would do that because the amount of money that raise won't be enough to, to help everyone, but at least it is something that that help families. And if it goes to broader scale and there is this humanitarian aid, aid and reach into the hearts of communities and distant places, then I feel that at that time we, we can feel like, uh, yeah, Afghans would, would survive this, this yeah. trying time now and also the, the harsh winter that would, uh, that would arrive very soon. Do you recommend any NGOs? I mean, do you recommend organizations that you know of that are working in Afghanistan? Uh, at the moment, I can't recommend any particular one, but, but still I, I can, yeah, I can research and can find out that, yeah, which NGOs are active because a lot of them that they were working on, on different like education, women rights, democracy, and then they, they are trying now to come up with other ways to help like fundraising and other things that with the support and team teams that they have on the ground. So uh, yeah, I, I can't recommend any at the moment, but I, I can ask and I can research and find out that which organization can do and then, then suggest, yes, sir. Thank you, thank you. Any questions for Ahmed Shah, please? No questions? Carolyn, please. Hey, um, my question is, um, are you seeing any shift in what I'm gonna loosely call the culture of the Taliban? Because we've always had, a, I think from, from our perspective, we've had sort of a two dimensional uh, um, idea of, of who this culture is. And, and I think it's probably a much more nuanced culture and maybe even has, um, sub-factions that are um, moving toward, I won't say higher education, but maybe you know, so they're gonna have to figure out how to do the technology and the economics and all that stuff. Are you seeing any sort of expansion in a, I wanna say positive direction uh, with the Taliban? Well, it's, it's hardly visible uh, that that, that there should be a kind of change in mindset and, uh, and, and mindset and, and other things. What we see on the news is totally different on what on, happens on the ground. Like on the news, they would say that they, they would respect women or they would 
be able to like, like let a uh, uh, woman go to work or the girls to receive an education and they say that that we have changed but what happens in on the ground and the reports that come in from the main cities where they are reported journalists to report but what happens in other communities and other provinces is something totally different and there is this big gap between what they say and what they, they do and it feels like they have not changed maybe in terms yeah. of the thoughts and uh, and, uh, and a physical appearance, they, they, they might have changed, but in terms of practices and everything, summary execution happens. And, and then uh, like the, the first displacement of Hazaras, who have like, has been prosecuted, who has been sent to exile, who uh, has been like prosecuted by, by the Taliban back in 1990s and, and later on that they've been like targeted. Then again, they, they face the same fate under Taliban. Mm -hmm. So uh, th there is no change. And, for them, in order to be able to, to run a country, they would need skills and experiences mm -hmm. and, and, and tools and everything to do that. And looking to them, they, they have not. And all their lives, they have been like, it has been spent on the mountains and fightings. Or so with fightings, with guns, how one would be or a group would be able to rule the country or to bring like economy or to help people so that they don't starve. So these are the, the things. And, and yet it seems for sure to, to stick to that um, Sharia law and that inter harsh interpretation that they have from that, that women are not allowed to work and they should have this kind of dress and all that. So they are all like, it seems like you stick to all that and ignoring their, their, their realities that things have changed. And also to see that they, if they want to run a country, they need to provide services to the people. And there is no change you know, in their practices at all. And they do the same thing that they've done in back in 1990s. Uh, Amit, I have a question to pick, piggybacks up on what you're saying. It, the, the kind of the core question is, should there be international recognition of the Taliban government? Not at all. Not okay. at all. How uh, international community should, should recognize uh, a group who do not have any respect, any belief in everything that like you know, in human rights, in democracy, in women rights, mm -hmm. or in in respect to diversity, in mm -hmm. respect to to other ethnic groups who are part mm -hmm. of the country. So, in a state of recognition, the international community should put pressure on the Taliban so that they accept their realities. They they allow the the women and girls to receive an education. And the sad thing is that they they do not let women and girls to go to work and uh, university and school and use it as a leverage in order to get recognition. And it, it takes like, yeah, they want to do that. And uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Carolyn, is that good? You, or you have a follow-up? No, sorry. Anybody else have a question? Other questions, please. Just open your mic, we'll do it that way. Uh, hey, David. Oh, um, go ahead, yeah. Thank you, Ahmed, for being here, I, I, I hope everybody back in Afghanistan is safe. I, I, I can't imagine. So I'm glad you're here to tell us the story. But I was just looking at Al Jazeera. The headline is uh, with 9.5 billion in assets and loans frozen and limits imposed on bank withdrawals, a humanitarian crisis unfolds in Afghanistan. So I guess my question is, if you can't trust the Taliban with anything, um, how, would, how would anybody how would you go about releasing this amount of money and and still be able to trust that they wouldn't take the majority of it or i mean how, how does that happen i I'm, I'm just curious that is actually yeah that is like a question or the theme of conversation between people that if uh, the assets are like unfreezed and they are released what would happen to that and maybe the the united states and also un and other international community should like find ways to ensure that it would go through other channels like UN agencies operating on the ground and through other that's. Uh, and uh, and I, th I think that would be the only way to do that. Otherwise then, as you said, that there is no guarantee that they will not misuse from that. And, and there is no guarantee that the, those money will reach out to the people or they, they would use it in order to provide services and, um, uh, to the people. So that is a, a big question that uh, I, I feel like the answer still hangs in there and, 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 
And uh, yeah, only that maybe they, they come up with a with solution to that and, and then to be able to, to release the funds. And, and other than that, maybe the, the, the attention would be to, to see that like the European Union, they, they announced that they would be able to like support 1 billion euros in humanitarian aid. And so far nothing has happened and people are wondering what happened to that. And, and, uh, and, and those are the things like the questions and the problems that is still there is. And uh, yes. Thank you. Other questions? Please. Um, what, ahead, what you, sorry, what do you see as the role that the United States needs to play a, 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 as an international power as opposed to through NGOs? Well, uh, the United States would uh, uh, like to see that identify and firstly like to put pressure on Taliban so that they, they come to terms with the new realities and to accept you know, the changes that happened in the country and to see that they would respect this, the women and the girls, the ethnic minorities, and they will not, you know, do the same practices or use the same practices that they did back then at the same time to, uh, yeah, to, to have this humanitarian aid and to identify or maybe the USID and other organization and NGOs that can help or that can reach to, to different communities or different uh, regions of the country and other organization or local organization that can, can reach uh, like to, to the people directly in order to make sure that the funds and the support that whatever there is would reach to the people and not only one particular group that they deserve, but also others. And that is a problem because in the country, like there are places in, in the country that in past 20 years, no welfare project has reached. It was people themselves who built up schools, who, who, who constructed their own roads. So this is a big challenge, uh, I think that, uh, and, and that with, there is no system that uh, to believe or to, to be sure that whatever support will go, it would reach to the people. Because maybe it would go, Taliban go, would go and give it away to, to a particular like group of people and not others. So that is, I think that th these are challenging things that uh, the United States and also the UN need to come up with, with ways to ensure that whatever support that they would provide for the Afghans, it would reach to the Afghans, not one particular group, but, but all groups and those who are deserving or those who are at the point of starvation. Thank you, Carolyn. We have about five more minutes. Any other questions for Ahmed? Shaw? Things that you're thinking about. Thinking, I mean, I also think about how you are explaining the situation in Afghanistan to your own students, right? You know, uh, this does not go unnoticed in our own classrooms. Um, and I think uh, particularly many of us have veterans in our classroom, for instance, or people who have spent time in that part of the world in other, in other ways. And, you know, talking about and sharing about um, their, you know, they have questions also about what's going on. So um, Ahmed would be, person to ask or at least to to kind of kind of share with. Fran, go ahead. Um, it's really important. I think maybe Ahmad uh, Ahmad's um, internet was not as stable because I don't see him anymore. No, he's back uh, in. He's back there. Yeah, he's there. Oh okay. Um, so one of the things that I, I found it really fascinating uh, last year in my peace conference, Ahmad was still in Afghanistan and the situation was um, stable. So he, um, uh, relatively stable. So he, he, he made a presentation at the peace conference at, at, the, at Global Wars College. And in his presentation, it was just amazing that, uh, but he had the pictures of Afghanistan that, you know, that they are really, those sceneries are um, really breathtaking. Uh, they, uh, why you know the the society and the colors and and people it's vibrant and um it was it was really amazing how much how many papers i read 
that they just recognized, they, they thought that Afghanistan was this place of war, play, people are playing, you know, they're at war with each other all the time. Um, the country is ruined and there is really no life there. And, and, and so they were like, you know, an eye opening, you know, with your uh, presentation, Amacha, that people did, oh my God, this is a beautiful place. Why is not everybody there to see this beauty and to see these people, especially when you mentioned that, you know, the majority, 65% are young generation and they felt like, oh my God, you know, we can identify with them. Um, so I think one of the things that, you know, we have to, in the States to think about, like in our classrooms, how much, you know, by connecting to the real society of Afghanistan, and really um, humanize Afghanistan for, for, for them, because this is not the kind of picture that they have in their mind. This is not the kind of picture that they have. It, it's kind of a lost cause. It's, they have been in war forever with each other, and it's combat zone, and there is nothing they can do, or the people are looking certain ways, and uh, no connection, and I think, it is our responsibility to really humanize Afghanistan for them and like really humanize the situation. Um, and, and while we, we talk about the atrocities of Taliban and everything else and the difficulties for the past four decades and everything else, um, but also really show the human side of Afghanistan that people are very, um, you know, it's a vibrant culture. Um, it's a, you know, the scenery is so beautiful. I don't know, I'm a, you know, I don't think you have access to your slides right now to show us some, but I think it's really important that in our classroom, we, we really bring a true picture of Afghanistan and people and the environment and everything else um, into it. And uh, people like Ahmad Shah can, can bring that to us, you know, kind of like, you know, probably classroom conversations uh, with those those things, I think it would be it would be great to have them. And uh, I was wondering if Ahmed, you can uh, you can kind of elaborate on that. That you know, talk about you know, really people of Afghanistan. What what do they really want? What do they really what do they really like? Oh, you mean as a young people, I always like had this 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 dream of seeing a, a peaceful, a prosperous Afghanistan in which everyone, no matter which background, which culture they come from, each one will have the same privileges and opportunities to be, to, uh, that everyone deserves and it should be given. And unfortunately, because of, you know, the systematic discrimination and, and, and that existed for centuries now, and we did not see that unity, that solidarity, that coming together and there has always been things that divided people on different things. And people have been identified with their culture, with ethnicity, with religion, with, with sect and, and uh, with, with other things. And I always feel like uh, as youth, uh, we need to come together, not only to work for, for a future uh, for all of us, but also to come together to talk about what are the things that we have in common? What are the things that pull us apart? and how we in a greater and laser extent go through the same problems. Inwardly, psychologically, we go through the same problems of insecurity and fear and anxiety and other things and how this would be able to help us to come together and to see that, you know, that regardless of all the physical differences and culture and other things, we are the same and we go through the same problems. And in order to, to succeed or not, to have a better future or not, we are the same. Uh, we will face the same fate and this may help us to come together. And that was something that I do uh, and we have been doing in Aipu to bring these young people. And maybe first they come, you see a little bit of nerve and anxiety on their faces when the first time they come together because they do not know each other. And it seems like maybe they had a verbal clash or something, everyone's eating serious. But when they talk, when they discuss and talk about the culture, the backgrounds and how there are things that they're in common and then they would develop that sense. And it feels like a, a small community, small family when they leave. And that is something that I always feel that 
young people are the change makers and they can fill this or can go through this personal trans uh, transformation and then go ahead and do the same thing in their families and their communities. I'm sorry, the cat is here and cat here. And uh, I think that is something that can happen and that people can do in the country to learn and also those, the youth that are in other places to see or to feel that how they belong to others, though they may come from a different place, though they may give a different name to the God, they, they may have like different language, but it, still they are the same. And in order to create a better peaceful world, we need to, all of us to work together because when there is you know, injustices, when there is war somewhere, all of us will be affected. And to, to create a better world, then we need to understand others and to need to talk to them and to support them and to see that how we would be able, one would be able to do that, though they might be far uh, from, from people that they are suffering, they go through challenging times. And I think it's a sense of responsibility to every young people or to everyone who has this sense of humanity, this sense of belonging and this sense that all of us no matter whether it's human nature, the world, all of us are together and we're part of each other and connected to, to, to each other. And that may humanize, as you said, humanize us and bring this sense of humility and this sense of, yeah, ha having a global family or a sense of relationship to others. And that can help so that we tackle the problems together and to advocate and to raise awareness and to support people who are struggling, who are going through the challenging times. Uh, thank you. That was so well said. I think that's where we're going to end it. And, and I don't think there's anyone who can follow up as eloquently as, as you have. So um, thank you, Ahmed Shah, for, for spending some time with us today. We are now, it's two o'clock. And, uh, um, and Ahmed Shah, if you want to put in your contact information in the chat, uh, yes. and people want to reach out to you, I think, uh, once again, um, he is a peace educator. Um, and uh, if you look at the work of his, of his NGO, which is not operating, he's doing a lot of work with young women in particular and children. Um, you know, the tragedy in Afghanistan is all around, but um, my heart breaks mostly for women, I think, sometime, uh, in how they're, they've suffered in all of this. So, um, Amnacha, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, for the opportunity and uh, thank you everyone for listening and for your questions and everything, yeah.